Welcome everybody um, to this webinar about how to get your writing done. So I assume that since you've um, since you're taking part in that webinar, you must all be in the process of um, working on your thesis or maybe procrastinating working on your thesis. And we want to make sure today that um, you will really manage to get done in time, get done su successfully and um, do also without burning out and with paying attention to important things like plagiarism and citations, references, and so on. So um, my name is Mette Cilindia. I'm an international student ambassador here at the University of Tartu. And so um, I'm a part of the ISA, the International Student Ambassadors. And what we are is we are um, a group of students of the University of Tartu um, that works together with the marketing team in order to promote academics as well as the programs of the University of Tartu. So a little bit of background, we're currently around 23 ambassadors from 16 different countries and all together from four different continents. So as you can see, pretty um, diverse in the setup. And yes, we will um, do the webinar event today. Uh, we have a special guest. So um, let me introduce to you Judah Lehen, who is the head of Center for Academic Writing and Communication. And today we will go through different important topics for thesis writing, such as um, practices that can help you in sitting down and writing the thesis, and also um, briefly go through some techniques like the Pomodoro technique, which is very popular and then basically review some tools that can help you in thesis writing. And Joda will also mention some important things about how to avoid plagiarism and why it's important to avoid plagiarism, as well as give some in intro into um, references in citations. Um, yeah, so at this point, I would hand the lead over to Joda. So mm -hmm. let's get started. All right. Uh, thank you, Mette. And um, yeah, thank you for the uh, International Student Ambassadors uh, for organizing the event. Um, so I was contacted again by the International Student Ambassadors, I think maybe now two weeks ago, to ask whether I can run this event again. So we did this last year when we had the first lockdown. And I think at that time, the hope was that we would not need to repeat it again. Uh, but as uh, fortune has it, uh, here we are a year later and we're running this event again. And um, the idea is perhaps that we are one year wiser. Uh, I'm not entirely sure whether that's really the case. Uh, but I think that for many of you, the situation actually is still the same. At least, well, you are one year further in your studies and you are working on your thesis and you really need to get your writing done in this current situation, which I think that for many of us, if not for all of us, is just incredibly uh, difficult, uh, whether it's difficult uh, personally or just difficult in order to get, you know, your mindset on studying or writing. Uh, writing is something that I do. Uh, it's something that I research. Uh, it's something that I um, primarily work for at the University of Tartu. So my main uh, profession here at the University of Tartu is, first of all, to, well, to lead the Center of Academic Writing and Communication. And what we do there is we research writing, uh, but we also support students, uh, primarily PhD students at this point, uh, but I also uh, well, give webinars or seminars to bachelor and master students about the writing process primarily. Um, so yeah, exactly as Mette also mentioned uh, at the beginning, uh, so I will actually talk to you about uh, what I think are maybe the most important criteria for you to understand in order to get your writing done. Writing itself is incredibly difficult. Uh, that's something that I want to start off right away. And I think maybe something that you are already experiencing. And I just want to take away some of those myths that you might have about writing and primarily want to motivate you to write. I think that's one of my key, well, key ingredients for giving you this, uh, this webinar. So instead of it just saying, well, get your writing done is perhaps more or less like, well, motivating you to get your writing done. 
Um, and I will do so by talking about uh, a number of things. And one of the things that made me smile, which uh, Meta mentioned, was, uh, was plagiarism. Actually, plagiarism is one of those things that we don't like to talk about because, well, you know, plagiarism is one of those things that you shouldn't do, right? Um, but yeah, it seems to be part of the conversation about writing uh, in general because it's one of those things that seem to, yeah, really weigh quite heavy on our shoulders when it comes to submitting a thesis and, of course, the words that we might have uh, about, you know, whether it's going to be all right what we do. But uh, yeah, without uh, any further well, lengthening the introduction, let's just start with the topic itself. Um, and just to give a brief introduction about, well, what academic writing really is. Uh, because getting your writing done perhaps is easier said than done, right? So I can tell you in order to get your writing done, you need to just write, right? That's a very easy solution, but it's actually much more complicated than this. And in order to try to find out what that complex situation is, it's more or less a question, okay, well, when, well, what is academic writing? And I asked this question to bachelor students, to master students, to PhD students, but even to uh, academics that I work with who are writing and publishing their articles. So what is actually academic writing? I think there's a lot of stigma on that uh, term. Uh, we have perhaps you know, wrong perceptions as to what it might be. And as, a, as, and as a result, you know, we put quite a lot of burdens on ourselves to try and fit what we do, what we write into this kind of concept of academic writing. So maybe just to take uh, five seconds or you know, a couple of seconds to think about, well, what is academic writing? What does it mean to you? Yeah, so when I asked that question, uh, and again, to everyone that I teach academic writing to, most of the general comments or most of the comments I get from the participants is that academic writing is formal, right? So there's, there seems to be this formal style of writing that needs to be associated to academic writing. Uh, academic writing is about writing about facts, right? So about academic facts, whatever they might be. Uh, academic writing is also about being able to follow a specific structure. Uh, Quite often we talk about language and grammar. Grammar has to be correct. Uh, language has to be correct. Uh, we are writing about facts again. Um, and of course we have to write about those facts using different sources. But if we look at these kind of descriptions when we think about academic writing, so much of those descriptions very much is re related to the style of writing. Right, so we look at this, this type of product and we look at the style that is there. We look at the formal language that is being used. Yeah, so we question ourselves, like, well, do I, as a bachelor student, do I, as a master's student, process this kind of formal language in order to write academically? Um, is it a professional type of language? Am I professional enough in order to write academically? Uh, but sometimes even when we think about this tone, it's about you know, trying to not convey emotion, right? So try to be very unbiased in the language that we use. However, at the same time, when we are researching the topics, we tend to be fairly engaged in the topic and perhaps even we have an emotional connection to that topic, right? So whenever we read something, we might get angry about the topic that we're writing or we really might want to have this idea that we want to change the world. But at the same time, it says, okay, well, you know, when you're writing that formal text, try to be unemotional, try to be unbiased. So there's, again, this kind of like discrepancy that we have between our personal ideas and then, of course, the text that needs to be there. So this is what we then call this type of academic style of writing. Um, of course, we also can ask ourselves, okay, well, what is formal language again, right? So what is professional language? Um, and, and how does that fit into what we do? And whenever I have written the text, well, how good am I of an evaluator of this? How good is my supervisor uh, an evaluator of this? Uh, but we'll come back to that a little bit later uh, when we you know, start to dive a little bit deeper into the way that you can get um, well, more reflection on those aspects. But I think for me, when we talk about academic writing, so going back to that question, it's much easier to try and think in terms of metaphors. And uh, well, you know, academic writing, I think, uh, as anything, is a journey. 
Uh, and of course, uh, when we think about the metaphor of journey, well, life is a journey as well. But let me try to explain a little bit what I mean by academic writing really is a journey. Um, in that, specifically in this context, there is you who is part of that journey. But it's not only you, uh, it also contains your text. So you're not traveling this journey alone. Um, and then there's also the reader, right? So we have three participants in a way that you need to take on that journey. And the first one, so you in this context is the one that is really doing much of the discovery. So you are part of that journey in terms of trying to learn about the topic that you're writing about. Uh, you want to convey ideas, you want to absorb ideas, you want to you know, imagine the emotional responses that you have to that, uh, to that topic that you're working on. Uh, but at the same time, then you have the text itself, right? So all of those ideas that you have created, you then need to start to transform into a text. And that text, of course, needs to become somewhat of a story. And much of that story is, in a way, something that starts with a once upon a time. And then, of course, at the end, we want it to be a happily ever after type of story. Um, but then at this well, the third character in this uh, in this journey, of course, is the reader. And the problem is that quite often we don't exactly know who the readers might be. But the important thing here is that actually when you are writing your text, right, so the first two actors, what you want to achieve is that you are going to actually change the ideas of the reader or perhaps move the idea or provide emotional responses to those readers, right? So in a way, when you write your, let's say, formal unemotional text, what you want that text actually to do is create a response in your reader. And that response, of course, can be a very strong emotional response. You know, if you are very passionate about your topic that you're writing, in a way you want that passion also to rub off to the reader in a academic way, right? So you want them to be convinced by the arguments that you present them. You want them to be swayed by, you know, the evidence that you provide with them. So it's really important to think about those three actors when you're writing. So you yourself, because it's usually when we are writing, we're thinking about ourselves and we're struggling with ourselves, but you have to think about yourself working on a text and convincing reader or trying to uh, imagine who the reader might be. The other thing, so in this context is perhaps not that academic writing is something, but actually that academic writing has something. And of course, this is pretty much true for most of the text, but when we well start to uh, look a little bit more deeper into those three aspects of purpose, audience, and tone, you know, so what we see is that academic writing has a specific purpose in terms of that you need to find purpose, and one of that purpose might be that you want to contribute to a field of knowledge uh, of a relevant topic. Uh, you have to think about your own purpose to write this thesis. Is your own purpose of writing this thesis uh, because you want to just get a grade or you just want to get it done? I think that for most of you, it probably if you ask that question, that might be the answer. But in a way that if you really wanted to get your writing done, perhaps it is worth asking yourself, okay, well, why am I doing this? Is there perhaps something in that text, in the investigations that I'm doing, in the writing that I'm doing that has a much, let's say, higher purpose? which is uh, something that we'll talk about a little bit later. The other thing, of course, is that when, we, when you think about your academic writing, it also has that specific audience, right? And in some cases, when we talk about those different levels, those audiences, of course, can be scholars. Uh, those audiences actually might be your peers, so the ones that you are working with. Uh, they might be researchers, they might be scientists. Um, in the case when you're writing a BA thesis or an MA thesis, they, the, the audiences actually might be your instructors. But then again, if you're writing for your instructors and they're the ones who are doing the evaluation of your text, now perhaps they are maybe not the right ones to write to. Of course, they have to be convinced, but perhaps who you want to write to is a much larger audience who will be able to understand your problem, right? If you only think about, okay, well, what are my instructors going to say? then it might actually not really help you to define a much stronger purpose for the writing that you do. And then of course, the you know, third one is that academic ha has this specific tone. Again, we see here that it might be unbiased, 
formal and emotional, but at the same time, it might also be informal or emotional, right? So the language that we use or the tone that we have to apply can differ can be different for the different types of text that you write, but also for the different parts of the text that you're writing, right? So if we think about, well, those different text types, so many of you, of course, in your study have written different essays. Uh, some of you who are perhaps writing an MA thesis might have already written a BA thesis. Um, so the difference between a BA thesis and an MA thesis. Uh, some of you are working on the literature review or working on the literature review for your thesis. And the way that you construct your literature review might have a completely different structure than, for example, the results that you're writing. Uh, but reports and summaries, all of them have different styles that can be included, right? So we may in an introduction or a literature review actually primarily talk about others rather than you, right? So where is uh, where are you in your text? Um, so in that sense, what you have to think about, of course, is that when you're working on those different genres, again, where is your purpose? Uh, where is your text? And of course, how are you going to work within this as a, uh, as a writer? And that part of it, it really is the most challenging part because specifically when we think about a much larger text, right, it requires a lot of planning. So the planning again is that part where we really think about the journey itself. Yeah, there's this starting point and of course this end point. So the starting point is that, well, more or less, okay, well, I'm going to put some words on paper and the end point might be, okay, well, I'm going to just submit it and just see what happens. Um, but what happens in between that part, right? So this is really the most important, uh, the most important journey that you are going to uh, work with. And of course that journey really also leads to many of those discoveries about yourself, uh, discovery about the ideas that you're writing, discoveries about the world in which we live, right? So you might actually want to change some people's ideas about the topics that you're working on. And I think that's the kind of purposes that will help you to become much more motivated and work with your text much more. And I think that will really help you to get your writing done. But let's uh, work a little bit more with that idea and the, well, the, the uh, journey metaphor, right? So the question here perhaps is that, well, is the journey metaphor helpful or not helpful, right? So from my perspective, I think that, you know, thinking about your writing as a journey is very helpful because when I see writers, uh, working on their text. Some of them actually are working on their text, which, you know, for a period of three months, others might be working on their text only for a period of two weeks. Um, but anything that you're doing within that period actually becomes part of the journey, right? Um, some of you might be thinking, okay, well, you know, that journey is not important because the only thing that I want to do is just get to that place where I can submit my text, right? So I'm, I really don't care about anything else that is going to get me there. Right, I just wanted to, to submit. And that's actually where, you know, that second part here on the slide is that there's an emotional response that we have to writing. And it's very much that emotional response that is so critical to getting your writing done, right? So if we think about that journey, think about the journey of writing, what kind of luggage do you take with you? So what kind of baggage do you have that will join you on that journey, right? Is it something, of joy and confidence, right? So the other question that I always ask every writer, um, every person that is writing a thesis or an article is do you find joy and are you confident in the writing that you do? And the answers usually are not always very pretty, right? So again, the question, if I could get some response from you, which I can't at this point, but maybe for you to think about it is, do you feel joy when you're writing? Or do you love writing? Do you enjoy writing your thesis? And well, it might change day by day. Um, but the other part, of course, is that the other luggage or baggage that you can take with you is this, well, this writer's block, right? So sitting down behind your computer for days on end, knowing that you have to write your thesis, but you're just blocked and you're looking at that white uh, blank page or you're looking at the text that you've already written and you're thinking, okay, well, how do I continue with this? Um, 
And of course, what we know from writing research or looking at different writers and how they work with their texts and how they get their writing done is that both block and another aspect about writing, which is perfectionism, yeah, are the are the least productive for writing. Uh, so any of you who, of course, are facing this writer's block and are actually very perfectionist in the type of text that you want to create, this really is not going to help you to get your writing done. And yeah, perhaps, again, that might be saying pretty much the obvious, but in a way, if you think about block and perfectionism, quite often we think about that product, right? So the end part of the journey where we just want to submit it. In this case, it's more, more about trying to find a little bit of joy and confidence in the little parts of the text that we are writing. Uh, and, and well, even if you can't write something on one day, yeah, maybe find some joy or find some confidence in writing one paragraph per day, or perhaps even six sentences per day, or even revising parts of your text per day. Um, because that will help you to get over that block. And we'll talk about some of the things that you can do in order to work your way to get away from block and also that idea of perfectionism. So what we know and, and something again that I hope I can really convey to you is perhaps really try to find some joy and confidence in the writing that you do. Yeah, despite the fact that it's a difficult thing and despite the fact that, uh, well, the journey that you're taking is, uh, is, is a challenging one. So think about that emotional response that you're having towards that. The other thing, of course, is that, well, what we should not do is really try to look at the end point of your writing. So the end point of writing, again, is that product, the writing guidelines that we are being given by our instructors, you know, the feedback that is given by our instructors. You know, those seem to not really help us. Again, what, we, what seems to help us in order to get our writing done is to find this, this inner motivation, this intrinsic motivation to be able to, to work on the text and again, to find that purpose or why you're writing that text, right? So that's the next question in some ways. Why do we write? So why, why are you writing an MA thesis? Why are you writing a BA thesis? Why are you writing? And of course, you know, we give you these tasks. Being at university, we give you, you know, the uh, final criteria of writing a BA thesis and writing an MA thesis. But why do we do this? Why should you do this? You know, does it provide any greater purpose if it is so stringent? You know, it, if it is about all these different styles that you have to, to, to worry about, if it is about trying to worry about whether it's going to uh, be plagiarized or not. Um, so why do we actually ask you to write? And again, it's, it's quite an important question to ask, uh, primarily because sometimes we have the wrong perceptions as to why we are actually writing or why we are actually asking you to write a thesis. And perhaps for you to also reformulate that for yourself to try to find a different purpose as to why you're writing that thesis. Because at that point, perhaps you might find a little bit of joy. So writing your thesis and well, reasons why we are actually writing actually really is about in my, in my opinion, those three important uh, points. And the first one is really developing your skills. Uh, and it's not only developing your skills of writing, because of course, the more you write, the better you become as a writer. And writing really is an important skill that you need all your life. Um, but it also is the skill of learning and thinking. Right, so skills development is the development of skills of writing, but at the same time, it's you're also writing because writing helps you to learn and writing helps you to think. And the general idea is that writing in some ways is synonymous to thinking. And well, probably many of you might experience this on a daily basis, right? If we go to the shop, we actually write down uh, you know, a list of shopping that we need to do. Uh, primarily because it will help you to remember the kind of things that you need to buy. Uh, but some of you might actually, you know, keep a diary for yourself. Uh, again, you want to keep a diary for yourself because you want to remember the events, uh, important events in, in your life. Um, but of course, if you're thinking about uh, the reading that you do, some of you might really be, you know, vigorous in writing notes. Uh, primarily because if you're writing those notes, it will help you to connect specific dots. And again, I will come back to this a little later because there are some specific tools which I think are really useful to help you get your writing done to support the learning and thinking. 
And then the last one, I think, again, is one of the most important ones, is that it will help you to create you, a voice, right? So you will have something to say, you will become somebody, you are actually investigating something of which you will become very knowledgeable, right? So you're reading up on a topic that you really uh, are incredibly passionate about, which you really see as a problem that needs to be solved. And as such that once you have finished writing that thesis, once you have finished your studies, you will take that with you and you will take that uh, competence with you and you will have a voice to, to, to talk about it. And again, that if we link that back to, you know, the tone uh, or the specific style, yeah, if we are not teaching you or if we are not asking you to be, for example, let's say emotional or uh, more informal about it, right, then perhaps we are ignoring your voice. Yeah, so in this context, what I mean to say here is that the story that you're telling in your text really matters. And again, if you think about those three actors, it matters for you. Uh, it matters very much for the text that others are reading. And therefore, it really also matters for the readers that you manage to attract to your text. Right. So being able to help yourself to uh, develop your, well, your skills, your learning and thinking will really uh, all of a sudden help you to become a more uh, confident person within the topic that you're writing about. Right. So again, the importance of learning and thinking, uh, learning and thinking about the topic that you're writing, uh, but also learning and thinking uh, about the topic you're writing about. Well, that was actually uh, the same thing. So how you are going to write about the topic, right? So about the topic and how you write about the topic. Um, if, you, if you think about you know, writing about the topic itself, um, what you need to try to think about is, again, your text in those different stages, right? So if we think about the text as an end product, again, you know, looking at, okay, well, I just want to get rid of it. What it might do is actually not help you to create your thinking. So a, more, a very important part of that learning and thinking is that you just write as much as possible um, in order to develop your thinking for it. So as a result, in order to get your writing done, uh, you need to really take your time to think before, you're, before you write. So that planning part, you really need to write a lot. And uh, for those of you who really are struggling with writing because you've well, struggled with the writing block, what I really suggest is just free write. Again, don't think about the tone. Don't think about the ideas that you need to convey uh, formally, uh, because it needs to conform to a specific academic style, but just write any idea just that comes to mind, right? So sit down, if there's a blank page in front of you, just, you know, start by typing, okay, well, I don't want to write, I don't want to write, but what am I writing about? And then you just keep, at some point, something will come uh, to your mind about uh, the topics that you're writing. And uh, at that point, what you're doing is just, just thinking and overthinking and rethinking about the things that you're writing about. And all of the text that you're writing in a free write, well, it doesn't need to end up in the thesis itself, right? But it is part of the process that, that you're working with. And of course, in order to get your writing done, it is about revising over and over again. So the more you write, the more you are able to revise. And I will just highlight this uh, in a minute to demonstrate actually the importance of revision in writing. So many of you might actually know what the writing process look, looks like. So again, quite often in writing, we talk about products and we talk about the process. So the process, again, very much that journey uh, metaphor, the product, you know, being, okay, well, there's a thesis at the end, which is going to be published and read, and I'm not going to touch it ever again. Um, but the process itself really is, again, those three, uh, th so those three different parts help you to think uh, and help you to find your voice are really important. So what we see here is, of course, in the pre-writing phase, identifying the audience, you know, defining that purpose, the purpose for you, but also the purpose for the text. Again, thinking, discussing, gathering ideas, reading, annotating, free writing and outlining. 
And then of course you have the drafting and revising. And what you see actually here in the writing process is that there's actually nothing about writing in that, say, in that sense. It's all about either pre-writing or about drafting or about editing, right? So there's nothing which really says, okay, well, you should be writing. What you should be doing is just, you should be thinking, you should be planning, you should just be putting text on paper, and then you should just be revising it and thinking about it. And then towards the end, of course, once you think, okay, well, I have my text, uh, at the end, you will then work about uh, work much more closely with the language itself, and then you know give it to your supervisors for editing and publishing. But the first two stages, of course, are, are the important one, and and that's something that I also really want to highlight in terms of okay, well, if we actually look at different types of writers, and um, in writing research we investigate, for example, professional writers, but we also investigate what we call novice writers. So if you think about yourself and you think about yourself as a writer, would you say that you're an expert writer or professional writer, or would you say that you're a novice writer? And what is the difference between them? Yeah, I think that most of you will say that, okay, well, I'm a novice writer um, and not a professional writer. But if we look at how different, differently they write, you know, we can see these two figures. Um, and I will explain what, the, both of them mean. So what happens is what we do is we put uh, two different writers behind a computer. Uh, we have a, um, a um, keystroke logger installed on that computer so we can see exactly everything that they're typing. Um, and then we set the timer uh, and then we ask them, okay, well, write a text about something. Um, and then we can see basically what they are doing and how they are typing or creating that text. And so the first one is the professional writer. I don't know, can you see my cursor? When I highlight? I can see it, so I assume it works. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so what we see here is the uh, time axis. And uh, for the professional writer, it's quite messy. Um, but this line here basically indicates the amount of characters the uh, writer has typed. Right. So imagine it's sitting behind the, the keyboard, it's just typing, typing, typing. And this is the amount of characters that are being typed. This, uh, this line here actually indicates the amount of characters that are left in the text. Right. So basically that means that the writer is typing more than double the amount of characters than is actually left in the text itself. So what happens is that the writer, a professional writer, basically is constantly revising its text as it's writing. And what you see here is in these places here are parts of the text where it just deletes and uh, adds text and then deletes it again and then changes parts, uh, cuts and pastes perhaps uh, such as here. There's a really large increase of text. So perhaps taking it from a website and then cuts and paste, which of course you shouldn't do because that would be plagiarism. Uh, but what it's doing then here is like doing lots of revision. Um, so making it uh, well fit within the text uh, of its uh, uh, for the purpose that it's writing. So what we see here as well are those green dots and those are the dots where the writer is actually pausing. And we can see that the pauses are fairly short, uh, which means that the writer probably already has a good idea and plan what the text should look like. And it's just creating the text uh, based on, well, just typing and uh, revising. So what we see happening with the novice writer, again, with the same task, lots of pauses and those pauses are fairly long and the you know the well this is the first part where the writing is done this is you know, pretty much where the writing is, is, is stopped and a little bit of editing going on but it's a very you know steady increase of just make every keystroke that you are making count right so don't waste any energy in this case of well writing the words that are going to end up in your final thesis and of course, that what happens here is that there's very little revision going on, if any revision at all. And um, yeah, the thinking here really takes a lot of time and effort. So what we see here is for the same task for the professional writer manages to create a text, which is uh, you know, a little less than 1500 characters. The novice writer, well, perhaps about 500 characters long for the same task, and it has taken uh, well, about you know, 37 minutes. 
So the reason why we actually show this, uh, this difference between professional writers and novice writers is that actually the research has indicated once we actually point out the differences between a professional writer and a novice writer, novice writers who see themselves or who see themselves fitting a little bit more into this category automatically will then start to change their habit a little bit to become a much more thinkers as, as writers. So they start revising their text much more. So it doesn't mean that novice writers you know, are bad writers in this case. It's just that there's very little planning going on and that the planning that they do actually takes a lot of time while they're writing. Whereas what you want to do is you want to do most of the thinking before you actually do the writing itself. So that goes back to the writing process, right? So the pre-writing phase that we're working with really is the most important part of your writing, uh, writing process. So think, and therefore, if you're not that far in the writing yet, it's okay, just as long as you're really pretty far in the thinking about the writing, right? At some point, you will sit down and everything will just blurt out. Okay, so going back again to the question, how to get your writing done? Um, of course, I think the most important thing about getting your writing down, uh, getting your writing done is actually to schedule your writing. I think one of the biggest mistakes that we make is actually not considering writing to be a task that we really need to plan. Um, and for example, I, I work a lot with PhD students and, and professionals. And um, yeah, what we see is that if, if they have an agenda, they never seem to set aside time for writing. Uh, so lots of time for meetings, for teaching, you know, all of those other things. But when it comes to writing, you know, when are we supposed to do this? Are we supposed to do, to do this in our own time? Are we supposed to do this at night? Are we supposed to, you know, go on a retreat uh, in the woods somewhere to write? Well, it would be nice, but, you know, that's not the way it works. And the way what you need to do is say, okay, well, tomorrow I have a slot between 9 and 11. Okay, what I'm going to do, I'm going to plan my writing. And anybody who wants to intervene, I'm just going to say no, because, well, I'm busy, right? Um... And it's really useful just to say, okay, well, even if in those two hours that you have reserved, you are just thinking about your writing, you are being incredibly productive, right? So that two hour slot does not necessarily need uh, to mean that you're actually sitting behind and writing. Of course, it would be great if you do, um, but make sure that you schedule your writing in your, uh, in your daily tasks. Uh, the other thing is, of course, again, planning, right? So scheduling is planning, um, but an important process here is, again, what part of your text are you writing? Uh, and the planning, of course, could also include just writing um, the results part, for example, of your thesis. Planning could be just reading a couple of articles related to a specific question that you have. Uh, planning could be, like, well, just free writing some ideas that I have. It could also be related to sharing your text with another. Uh, it could be anything which is related to the text that you're producing anyway, right? So it's again, that imp important component when you think about the whole journey itself. You know, planning when you want to get, uh, you know, when you, when you want to get a specific task out there. Um, and then the final thing I think really is about finding that purpose. Well, I mentioned that right at the beginning, but finding a purpose, and, and, and perhaps I will give this as a task to you at the end, but maybe just a task for you to think about and just to write it down. You know, what is my purpose when I am writing my BA thesis or MA thesis? Why am I writing it? You know, is it because you want to influence or persuade others? Uh, is it because you want to improve your skills of writing or just improving your skills of language? Uh, is it because you really want to change the world? And why not, right? But make sure that you have that uh, purpose. If the purpose is just writing for a grade, ask yourself what grade do you want to get, right? If it is an A that you want to get, then, well, you have to think, okay, well, what criteria do I need to meet in order to make it an A? Um, so all of these actually questions are really important. And actually all of those purposes are great, right? So even if you're just writing to get it done um, for a grade, then, you know, just explore that a little bit more. Um, the other thing, of course, is that 
when we think about getting your writing done, we can't think about, well, we cannot not think about the context in which we are writing, right? So the situation where we are, and of course the current situation where we are is that some of you might really be stuck in your room looking at that blank page for days on end. Um, but of course it doesn't end there, right? So specifically when we think about writing itself and writing is quite often thought to be this kind of like solitary task that we have to do by ourselves. It isn't, right? So writing is actually an incredibly social act that we have to uh, work on. And I mentioned this, of course, at the beginning when we think about that journey and the three actors who are there, if we don't actually work with readers, you know, then of course we are never going to achieve the, the task that we set out to do. Right, so what we need to do in this, uh, in this, well, let's say, context is we have to think about the cultural context in which we are. You know, we have to, of course, think about the social context in which we are and the physical context and how they will change the way that we approach the writing task, might change the way that we are working with our thesis. And also think about, well, which readers can I actually involve? Right, so how many of you are actually working together on your thesis? And what I mean by that is not writing your thesis together uh, or writing well, one thesis together, but actually working together, both writing on your thesis or a whole group of people working on the thesis because you're all actually in the same situation, right? What you can do is just plan those things together and say, okay, well, let's meet next week, uh, Monday from nine to 12, online, turn on our cameras. And what we're going to do is just going to write, uh, or at least we're going to do the writing part. And you keep each other in check, right? And saying, okay, well, no Facebook, no anything else, just write together and see how that might help you to motivate each other. And by the end say, okay, well, what did you achieve? What did you achieve, right? The other thing of course that you can do is then to say, okay, well, once we have written something together, perhaps share it. Right, so give each other a paragraph or two paragraphs or three pages to read and perhaps give feedback on each other. And uh, this is just, you know, friendly feedback amongst friends, amongst uh, colleagues, uh, etc. cetera. Um, but the idea is more or less, okay, well then all of you are contributing to the text that you are writing because of course you're just giving feedback as a reader. But the thing is, is that the text that you're writing actually is for a reader, right? So it's always uh, useful. Um, and then again, you know, trying to find that purpose. So that purpose really does come back uh, constantly. So make sure that you actually, well, engage with others about your writers, about your writing. Uh, and when I mean also engage uh, with others about your writing is actually ask each other, okay, well, you know, how's that writing going, right? And maybe to talk about the writing block that you're facing, uh, talking about the, you know, horrible feedback that you got from your supervisors or, you know, talk about uh, the struggles that you have in trying to find the right resources or, or anything. Um, and then to say, okay, well, let's try to make agreements for each other and uh, read each other's text and give each other feedback um, and discuss the text itself, right? So one of the things that, uh, that we do quite often with, uh, with PhD students is these, well, nowadays online writing uh, what we call shut up and write sessions. Um, and um, yeah, one of the things that, uh, that we are thinking of also organizing with the uh, international student ambassadors is a shut up and write sessions for you uh, as an example, but uh, it's basically planning a morning session and then just, you know, throwing it out there on, uh, on Twitter or Facebook and inviting PhD students to come and write. Um, and then, well, we all meet, there's a very strict schedule that is going to be uh, worked on. Uh, for example, we write for an hour, then we have a 10 minute break, then we write again for an hour. Uh, and then in this case, you know, get writing done. Uh, and it works really, really well for those PhD students who are struggling to find that motivation to write. So that social dimension here is incredibly powerful. Uh, the other thing that we also do in those shut up and write sessions is the Pomodoro technique. And this is something that Meta already mentioned at the beginning. So the Pomodoro technique, for those of you who don't know it um, and are really struggling with writer's block, use it. 
And it's, it might seem a little bit uh, funny at first, um, but there are quite a lot of apps available for your phone or even for the computer. You just you know Google Pomodoro technique. And the general idea is that you work for 25 minutes and then take a five minute break. So you set the timer, 25 minutes, and then you just work, focus on whatever, distraction free. So that's, I think, the biggest challenge, right? So for 25 minutes, you can see the timer, don't get distracted, you know, don't do anything else. You know, even if you know that your phone is next to you or, you know, that the internet is just right there for grabs, resist. And for those 25 minutes, don't do it. Just focus on the task that you set for yourself. Because after those 25 minutes, when the bell uh, rings, you have five minutes of freedom and you can explore whatever you want to do. Then the bell rings again, focus on for 25 minutes on the task that you have set yourself. And then after 25 minutes, again, the, the bell will ring and you have five minutes to, uh, uh, to do whatever you want to do. And doing this for a couple of uh, iterations really helps you to start getting into a flow of work and really helps you to just focus and, and, and get, well, get stuff done. In this case, get your writing done. It is a really, really powerful tool, specifically for those who are really struggling to, uh, to find that focus. For some of you, 25 minutes might actually be too short. And you, what you do is then say, okay, well, if 25 minutes is too short, let me just extend that for an hour, 45 minutes. You know, so it's adjustable. If it's too long, then first say, okay, well, 10 minutes focus, five minutes break, 10 minutes focus, five minutes break. The most important part of it is here that you just become productive and focused on the, on the work that you're doing. Highly, highly recommend it for anybody who really wants to focus and get, get their work done. Other tools which I can really recommend, um, and some of them in this case are related to just, well, remaining focused, other tools perhaps related to working with language, if language are issues that you're really struggling with, um, are, well, these four tools. So you know, actually one of them is, is quite an interesting tool, which I will talk about a little bit. Uh, but yeah, self-control is one of those apps that you can install, uh, install into your uh, computer to try and block all applications which are giving you distraction. Uh, very useful if you're working on a Pomodoro. Um, and really just uh, install an app and just say, okay, well, if I turn it on, I can't access anything. And it just helps you to, uh, to remain focused. For those of you, I think that, well, Grammarly should be uh, freely available for anybody at the university. Um, there's another cool tool, which is called uh, Trinka. Both of them are quite useful when it comes to uh, helping you to work on language related issues. Personally, um, I, I can see different people interacting with it differently. And uh, for myself, for example, I, I don't like it because it, it's intrusive. It just blocks my thinking uh, because what it does at some point is just it highlights the mistakes that I'm making and then I'm going back to try and correct them. Whereas what I, what I really would like to do is just to keep thinking and writing and then later on I can change it. So it depends on the way that you interact with it. But I think that both of them really do help to try and get a bit of a uh, reflection and feedback on the kind of style that you're working on. Uh, so Trinka is much more related to uh, academic and technical writing, but yeah, Grammarly of course has been in the market, on the market already for quite a long time. Both of them I think I can recommend, but it's something that you have to play with. Um, problem is, is that don't use those tools to uh, as, as a form of, um, as a form of, uh, well, not focusing on writing, right? So it can be, it can be a distraction. Um, other very useful tools that I can definitely recommend, uh, specifically when it comes to getting your writing done, but more or less also getting your thinking uh, in place, are tools, of course, like uh, Mendeley and Zotero. So Mendeley and Zotero, those are uh, reference management systems. Specifically for those of you who are writing a BA or a thesis, Right, you have a lot of references that you have to work with. Um, and trying to manage those references is really important because you will need them in a way to present in your end product. Um, and they need to be formatted according to the style guide that your department gives you. Um, so making sure that you know every article that you're reading or every article that you're making notes on, if you drag them into Mendeley or Zotero, you just have them saved. 
And quite often you can use Mendeley and Zotero as well to make notes. So those notes are also saved. Specifically, if you use a highlighting tool when reading PDFs, uh, it's very useful also to extract them. Um, so there, if you actually want to work again much more with Mendeley and Zotero, there are some really, really useful guidelines on, uh, on uh, YouTube to help you to, uh, to master the tool itself. It's a very, very simple tool to work with. Uh, but again, that if you're in your bachelor and you know that you're going on to a master, or if you're on a master and knowing that you're going to go on to do a PhD, uh, highly recommended to actually work with those tools because you will certainly need them. Um, there are two other tools here, which I'm, uh, are mentioned. One of them is uh, Notion and the other one is Obsidian. These are basically note-taking tools. And so uh, note-taking is a form of writing. And of course, writing is a form of thinking. So if you, for example, very much take notes on paper or do lots of highlighting in text, um, it becomes, of course, very difficult then to try and find everything again, right? So you need to be incredibly systematic in order to work with those. Uh, Notion and Obsidian actually will do that in a much more uh, systematic way uh, online. Uh, so again, it will help you to highlight, make connections and, uh, and thinking. So if, if actually you're in that part or in that process where note-taking is very much what you're doing, in order to get your writing done, then uh, then I do um, well invite you to explore them. So there, I think that specifically for the process is very useful. If you're already part of you know getting that product done, then I would perhaps steer away from those. Then of course the uh, yeah the final product um, that we uh, well want to talk about here in this case is uh, plagiarism. Um, yeah, maybe there's, well, one thing that I want to say about plagiarism and is that, well, don't do it, right? Um, but I know that it's maybe, again, a, a simple answer, but actually the solution is very, very simple. Actually, everything that I've talked about earlier is to prevent you to plagiarize, right? Because plagiarism quite often comes at that part where we are working on the product. And again, when we see a product, we see lots of text and we see lots of things that just need to be there. And we also see other texts which have already been published. And well, sometimes we just, you know, copy paste or, you know, take it from the other text, you know, write it in there and we forget to reference it. And as a result, we forget where they might have occurred from. And therefore we start to, uh, you know, start to enter that question of, well, is that plagiarized or is that not plagiarized? If you really want to check whether you are, uh, whether your text is free of plagiarism, uh, then Urkund, of course, is the tool that the University of Tartu uses. And um, I think all of your supervisors uh, or uh, instructors will have access to Urkund. So what you need to do is just uh, ask them whether you can send your text through Urkund to see whether the report actually provides any um, uh, any uh, similarities to text that can be found online or not. The topic of plagiarism, I think, is, is very, very complicated, uh, specifically if it's something that you're really worried about. And if you're really worried about it, then um, then actually, you know, do let me know. So you're free to contact me uh, and I'll be happy to also upload your text to see whether there's any form of plagiarism or not uh, and talk to you about the kind of reports that are being produced. Uh, for the uh, for in those plagiarism reports, but my advice really is is that if you go through the steps that I've outlined earlier to get your writing done, there should be no plagiarism in your text at all. So, um, yeah. Then of course, yeah, the last thing that I want to uh, mention about specific tools, of course, um, you know, the, the web related as well to the situation in COVID actually does provide a rich source of uh, ideas. Uh, specifically on trying to get your writing done. But the problem here is that the web also provides too much information, right? So again, what we're doing here is procrastinating. You know, we're looking for tools that might be useful. We're looking for tools that might do the things for us. But in the end, right, it's still you who has to do it. So it's still really trying to find a purpose while you're writing, plan the content that you're working with, enter the dialogue with your readers, plan the text itself, share your writing, 
yeah, don't well beat the block, right? And don't be a perfectionist and really be free in the text that you write. Yeah, so don't worry about it too much. Um, and that's actually it from me. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, yes. At this point, Jula, thank you again for really going through all these topics and uh, taking the time to um, clarify certain aspects and give tips about tools or techniques such as Pomodoro. Um, and exactly. So we're slightly over time, but I think we can do some minutes of q and I see already that we have three questions in the Zoom. So um, I've also noted one or two things down that could be interesting for uh, especially bachelor's and master's students. Um, maybe I can just mm -hmm. give over to you. We can go through the questions in the Zoom and then um, go ahead. And yeah. Um, yeah, sure. So I think one so, of the... Um, <clears throat> so yeah. Uh, so the, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, just, Okay, I'm I, just looking at the first question. Yes, exactly. So that one came in pretty much in the beginning um, when you were talking about tone of writing and stuff. Um, yeah, so... so the question was, uh, how would you describe tone of research proposal for PhD? Yeah, this is uh, actually quite a specific question. And mm -hmm. uh, again, it, it depends on the different type of research proposals that are being written. Um, so actually current research proposals um, tend to actually become much more informal. Um, and that's primarily because those people who need to evaluate whether your research actually has or is going to be useful or is going to have an impact are um, you know, people who actually are not academics. And so a lot of times, you know, as academics, we tend to write in a tone which is only understandable for academics. And, uh, and that's not a good thing. So the tone of research proposals actually is becoming much more informal. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I'm pretty sure there must be also a lot of resources online. And um, if you have still further specific questions, then you're also welcome to reach out and uh, we can answer any open questions afterwards as well. Um, so going through the others, um, I just see an interesting one, which is concerned with the, with the writing group. Um, Mohamed is asking how to join a group for PhD students to shut up and write. Um, well, together with... Um, <laughs> some colleagues at the uh, Communicating Science, which is the uh, PhD course. Uh, we actually thought, because we are running a couple of Shut Up and Write sessions, uh, we actually thought to well, reach out to the international student ambassadors to invite um, well, anybody to join those. Um, so what we will do is actually we will send out a, uh, an invitation to, well, you met the, in this case, mm. or the international student office to actually well for those dates that we have it's uh, and the other thing of course is that uh, you know what we hope because anybody can organize these type of events so we do this because it's it, it somehow is quite useful for somebody to run those events uh, but like I said earlier that if you are a small group of people um, you can run these kind of events yourself as well but uh, but yeah we will send out invitations and, uh, and get them through the list that um, that you also got this invitation for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, in that case, I also want to remind everybody to make sure to follow us on Facebook, um, the International Student Ambassadors page, so that you can basically stay up to date on exactly events like that that are um, or that have the purpose to help you in succeeding in academics and in that case, getting your writing done. So um, you can both visit us on Facebook and also at isa.ut.ee. Um, going on with the questions, I see that um, one is asking for a tool recommendation for creating mathematical quotations. Do you have something there, Judah? Or um, yeah, mathematical quotations primarily LaTeX. Uh, LaTeX. So that's L-A-T-E-X. 
Uh, it's the language which is being used to create mathematical cre quotations primarily. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a programming language as well. Um, but yeah, that's the only one that I can highly recommend. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, yes, so I would actually have one more question. So in the beginning, we talked about um, the different uh, characters of the journey. So basically you, the text and the reader. And I know from uh, undergraduate students, as well as from master's students, that um, the thesis reviewer who, are, uh, who is uh, giving feedback at certain stages and will also sit in the jury at the defense is playing a very important role when it comes to the direction of the thesis and also to the final grades or the final result. Uh, maybe question from my side is how would you recommend to incorporate this feedback into your work as um, a student? Um. Yeah, in, in general, when we, uh, yeah, again, there, there's, there, there's these different actors which are coming into play because uh, a lot of times when we were writing our thesis, and this also comes back a little bit to one of the questions which was asked, uh, is that, um, well, related to your voice or related to em emotion, right? So we, ha we are so involved in the things that we are writing that sometimes when we, uh, well, when we get a response or when we get feedback, uh, it just hurts us immensely because, you know, we put so much uh, effort into that. Um, so actually it is about thinking that any of the feedback that you receive is feedback to help you improve the text. And again, sometimes a really good uh, stance to take for yourself is that the text that you're writing is actually not your text at all, right? So the text that you're writing is actually the text for the reader to read. Um, so trying to distance yourself a little bit from that text um, helps you to actually incorporate the feedback from that reader's perspective. So quite often the, the reader or the, um, you know, the opponent within the pre-defenses will give guidelines as to what can be done in order to improve the uh, clarity of the text or clarity of the arguments or clarity of the research questions, etc. So these are always, always valuable comments. Um, and valuable comments primarily because most likely that as a reader, they just were not clear enough. So, yeah, sometimes actually distancing yourself from that text really helps. And that might seem to uh, be perhaps a little bit um, yeah, it might be, might be somewhat different to what I said at the beginning where, you know, we, where you are actually creating your voice as a writer. Um, but once you are creating uh, your voice in that text as a writer, it should come out basically for the reader again. Right. So, you know, the, the question here was also a little bit about, um, if, if the text or the text that you're writing is not yours. Um, but for example, given by your supervisor, right, can you still find joy or can you still find a voice in this text? And, and of course it is, because it is again about just trying to find the purpose of the text. And the purpose of the text really might be just to change ideas, you know, for your supervisor or for any of the readers. I don't know, Mette, if that answered your question? Yeah, that goes pretty much it. So. Um, I honestly do not have uh, any more questions from my side. So um, yeah, huge thank you again from both the International Student Ambassadors, as well as um, I would say in the name of all the participants, I guess, for Judah taking the time to walking us through how to finish your thesis. Um, so also thank you for the short recap in the end. Um, one more important thing that I want to mention is the idea of having these um, sessions in the morning where people can write together. So we will definitely be in touch about that one and also discuss it internally at ISA to make sure that we can organize this ideally for you students so that you can really top up your writing game. And yes, other than that, if you have any critical questions, then I welcome all of you to contact us, the International Student Ambassadors, and we will make sure to really answer everything in a way that it will help you move forward. 
And finally, I want to thank you again, Joda, for taking the time. And um, yeah, wishing everybody a pleasant day. Thank you. Thank you, Mette. And thank you, everyone.